what is up everybody welcome back to another video on the channel and this video is going to be about the nba playoffs because we have our final four teams the boston celtics going up against the indiana pacers in the eastern conference finals and then in the west we have the minnesota timberwolves against the dallas mavericks and i wanted to make this video to talk about the two game sevens that were played on sunday the first one was between the pacers and the new york knicks so as we all know the Pacers won in seven against the Knicks. And at the end of the day, it really just came down to all of the injuries for New York. OG Ananobi tried to gut through his hamstring injury. Obviously, no boy on Bogdanovich. Josh Hart tried to play through an abdominal strain that he sustained in game six. And if you guys watched that game six last week, you could, you could just tell throughout the whole game that Josh Hart was not right. Something was going on with him and he tried to play through it. And he even asked Tom Thibodeau to take him out of the game at one point. This is a guy in Josh Hart who basically plays every minute of every playoff game for the Knicks, asking to come out of the game. So you know it must have been bad and painful what he was dealing with. He tried to gut that out in Game 7, didn't really work. And then, to top it all off, I don't want to say it's a fitting way for the season to end for the Knicks, but it really wasn't all that surprising. Jalen Brunson got injured in Game 7. He fractured his left hand, which we all know is his shooting hand. It's his dominant hand. And that was all that she wrote for the New York Knicks this season. And look, the Pacers did what they were supposed to do in the first two rounds of the playoffs. They came out as the healthier team and beat the injured opponent that they were facing. They played the Bucks in round one. Giannis obviously missed the entire series. Dame played the first two games, got hurt in the middle of game three, missed games four and five, tried to, gu tried to gut it out in game six, didn't really look like himself. And then even Chris Middleton, a guy who played the whole entire series, hurt both of his ankles in that series, so he was playing hobbled. Bobby Portis got ejected in Game 4, and even Patrick Beverly was hurt, so the Pacers did what they were supposed to do. They won that series, and then they played the Knicks, who just kept losing more and more and more players. Mitchell Robinson was another guy who was out for the Knicks. Boyan Bogdanovich, a shot creator off the bench who the Knicks acquired at the deadline, wasn't able to go. But really, the key injury for New York in that series was the OG Ananobi injury. As I noted in my last video, the Knicks were 26-5 and in games that Ananobi played, and he was really going to be the difference maker in this series. And the Knicks went up 2-0. They almost went up 3-0 if Nemhard didn't hit that insane step-back three-pointer in Game 3. But I mean, look, the Pacers really did what they were supposed to do. They took care of business, business at home, and they found a way to steal one on the road. That's what they were going to have to do take care of business at home and find a way to win the last game on the road and props to them they're going to the eastern conference finals for the first time in a decade since the last time that they were there when paul george led them up against the lebron james miami heat and i think it's going to be a different type of series for indiana when they go up against boston i don't want to dwell on it too much because i want to talk about the other game seven but i mean they're going to be playing the celtics and the Celtics are obviously going to be without Kristaps Porzingis for the first two games, but I still think that Indiana is going to have to guard Boston differently than they've been guarding both the Bucks and the Knicks because the Celtics have multiple creators. Derek White is a guy who can get you 20 points. We know what Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown can bring to the table, even though the consistency of both players is something that has been in question. So, I mean, I think that's going to be a fun series. It might not be a fun series on paper for basketball fans who want to see household names play in the conference finals i mean tyrese halliburton had a really good season for the pacers this year guys like aaron neesmith andrew nemhard are lesser known miles turner's been there for a while i think since the pacers have a fun style of basketball that they play they love to get up and down they're healthy for the most part still missing benedict matherin with a shoulder injury another guy who's been really good for indiana this season they're healthy for the most part the Celtics are healthy minus Porzingis, so I think it's going to be a really fun series between those two teams. I think this, that the Celtics ultimately end up winning in six games. I think the Pacers are going to get two games. I think they'll be able to steal one out of two in the Garden, and then I think they'll be able to get one at home before the Celtics put an end to their season. And hey, an Eastern Conference Finals appearance, I'm not sure that was on the bingo card for most Indiana Pacers fans this year. So I would say that that is definitely a successful season in my books. They traded for Pascal Siakam. That's going to be a fun duo to watch down the line. Halliburton and Siakam. See how they can evolve. And maybe they can get one more big star to go to Indiana and truly solidify themselves as a championship contender. So big ups to the Pacers. We'll see what they can do against the Celtics. I'm kind of talking like their season's over. But I mean, you still got to play the game. So let's see what happens against the Celtics. Maybe they upset everybody's 
uh, playoff bracket and they go all the way to the finals. I doubt it, but let's see what happens against Boston. And then just to quickly dwell on the season for the Knicks, I mean, they probably need another really good shot creator to really get into that upper echelon of championship contenders because I mean Julius Randle was injured but in the previous years that the Knicks made the playoffs and Julius Randle played he wasn't all that good in particular last year against Miami wasn't that good in the closeout game and then 2021 was probably even worse against Atlanta in the first round that was a series that most people thought the New York Knicks should have won and Julius Randle just got completely outplayed by Trey Young and did not show up at all so I mean Dante DiVincenzo really good postseason for the Knicks at the end of the day, the Knicks just didn't have enough shot creators to really establish themselves as a true threat in the Eastern Conference. And some of that was due to injuries, and some of that was due to, even if they were healthy, I'm not sure that they had enough scoring to really compete with a team like the Celtics or anybody that came out of the West. So, I mean, it's going to be a big offseason for the Knicks. We'll see what they can do. We'll see what they do to upgrade their team. They got to get healthy. They got to enter the playoffs healthy. I think that's the number one priority for the Knicks. Just be healthy entering the postseason. But now I want to transition to the West because the Minnesota Timberwolves and the Denver Nuggets played a fantastic playoff series. I think it lived up to everybody's expectations. Maybe not who won the series, but in terms of the excitement involved. So just a quick recap. Minnesota goes on the road, steals the first two games, completely embarrasses Denver in game two. Anthony Edwards is getting MVP chance in the opposing team's arena. And then for games three and four, the Nuggets get back on track. They steal those games. So the road teams are winning all the games to start the series. And then Denver goes back home for game five. Nikola Jokic goes absolutely ballistic, scores 40 points. And then it looks like that series is over because the Timberwolves were up 2-0. They went on the road and won the first two games, were not able to protect home court at all, completely squandered that opportunity. And then they go on the road and just got completely demoralized by the reigning champs with who some people are calling the definitive best player in the world by a mile. I don't think that's the case anymore. He still might be the best player in the world, Nikola Jokic, but the gap is not as big as people the, the gap is not as big as people think, and I think there's a lot of guys that could be competing for that top spot right now. But anyway, and so the Timberwolves are at home for game six, and then they come out ready to go. The Nuggets actually started that game up 9-2, to and then Minnesota called a timeout, went on a 20 to nothing run, and that was pretty much all that she wrote in that game because the Nuggets ended up losing by 45 points, and they only scored 70 points for the entire game. 70 points. For the entire game that was the second time that the minnesota timberwolves defense really really got into denver and they really got them out of their element very physical with them did not allow them to get anything going and so they win game six and then game seven it's looking like the nuggets are going to do what they're supposed to do protect home court they have the best player in the series but that's not what happened there was a little bit of a back and forth defensive battle to start jamal murray really got it going in the first half he had 24 points in the first half after starting the game one of five from the field with just three points so it was looking like it was going to be another jamal murray stinker because that's what it's been the mostly the entire playoffs besides him hitting a few game winners against the lakers and i know those are big shots but if you look at him for the entirety of the playoffs he hasn't really been that good and so it looked it was a slow start for jamal murray but he got it going and the nuggets entered the half up i believe it was 15 points and at the time, nobody had come back from a deficit larger than 11 points, I believe, in a Game 7. So history was not on the side of the Timberwolves. And so the third quarter starts, and then the Nuggets ex extend their lead to 20 points. And it's looking like it's over because Anthony Edwards wasn't doing anything in the first half. Carl Anthony Towns was keeping the game respectable. He was keeping them within striking distance. I believe he had 13 in the first half. Rudy Gobert, who just is the subject of... NBA trash talk everybody even current players just love to talk trash about Rudy Gobert and so he was having a really good game too so that was really what was keeping the Nuggets or the Timberwolves excuse me in the game Anthony Edwards wasn't having his best night but his supporting cast was really really good and effective and that's what kept them in the game even when they were down 20 and then the Timberwolves rattle off a 28 to 9 run in the third quarter to get back within the game they got it to single digits and Anthony Edwards was able to get himself going with two steals at half court that led to transition dunks. That really got him going defensively, I think, because his intensity really picked up on that end. He never really found his flow offensively, but defensively, he really started to lock in and own that matchup against Jamal Murray. And really, 
lock him down for the majority of the second half. And so big ups to the Timberwolves for coming back and winning that game. Anthony Edwards obviously had that dagger three in the corner that really sealed it. And then Carl Anthony Towns had a really nice putback dunk to put them up 95-88, I believe. Really, the big three for the Timberwolves all had amazing plays. I just named those two Anthony Edwards dunks, the Carl Anthony Towns putback. And then Rudy Gobert hit one of the... I don't know if I want to call it luckiest shots, but probably the biggest shot of his entire NBA career, hitting a fadeaway over Nikola Jokic that put the Timberwolves up like three or four points. But you could just tell that all the momentum was with the Wolves because if Rudy Gobert is going fading away from his opposite shoulder and hitting fadeaways over you, you can just tell that the momentum is on the side of the Timberwolves if he's hitting shots like that. And so the big three really stepped up, even though it wasn't necessarily scoring for Anthony Edwards, he stepped up in terms of letting his teammates not carry him, but help out, be involved for once, because the whole game plan for the Nuggets defensively was stop Anthony Edwards. We'll be fine if Cat gives us the 25 to 30. And that's what I said in my preview video that I posted. I said that Carl Anthony Towns was going to have to give Minnesota 25 to 30 points if they wanted a realistic shot to win this game and he gave him 23 and 12 that's close enough so carl anthony towns played a great game but another player that i really want to highlight for the timberwolves is Jaden mcdaniels because he had 23 points and for the entire series he was playing amazing defense against the nuggets he also had a really good game six as well so Jaden mcdaniels is a guy that if you watch anthony edwards's post game interviews he's very quick to give Jaden mcdaniels a lot of credit for what he brings to this team because he's great defensively and so far in these playoffs, when he's been needed offensively, he's responded to the call. He's hit big shots from the corner. He's done everything. And the Timberwolves really just snatched the souls of the Nuggets last night, the defending champions. And they're moving on to the conference finals to play the Dallas Mavericks, which I think should be a really great series. And here we go. But to end off this video, I want to go on not necessarily a rant, but I want to talk about Nikola Jokic and the Nuggets because... Ever since the Nuggets won the title last season, I've had to sit and hear that Nikola Jokic is on his way to top 10 all-time status. It's a foregone conclusion that the Nuggets are going to repeat. Jokic is going to have three MVPs, two finals MVPs, two rings to his name. He's one of the 10 greatest players of all time. And I think what NBA fans need to do is just slow down and relax. Don't be so quick to crown people when they haven't done the things that you say they're going to do. People were saying kind of similar things about Giannis when the Bucks won in 2021, but now we're sitting here three years later, they've won one playoff series in the last three years. Most of that is due to injury, but you just can't make these predictions about these players when they haven't actually gone out and done it yet. And I'm sorry, the definitive best player in the world, I'm hearing this is the best player in the league by far. Nobody is even in his class, which is just not true because when you look at what Giannis gives you every night, 30 points, 12 rebounds, six assists, and great defense, the best two-way player in the league, you can't tell me that the best player in the world, Nikola Jokic, is miles and miles ahead of him. Or even a guy like Luka, who had a tremendous season for the Mavs this year, led the league in scoring. You can't tell me that Nikola Jokic is miles ahead of him. Or Shea Gilgis Alexander, the guy who had 30 points on the youngest team ever to win a playoff series, the youngest team ever to be in game six of the conference semifinals. You can't tell me that Nikola Jokic is just so much better than all of these guys. That's not true, and it came into fruition last night. And so, Look, Nikola Jokic is a great player, but as far as I'm concerned, the definitive best player in the world is not going to blow a 20-point lead at home in a Game 7 when you're the higher seed and you were up three games to two and had a chance to close them out. And in that Game 6, when you had a chance to close them out, you lost by 45 points. And look, that's not all on Jokic. Jokic had a great game. If you want to be a box score, you can look at the box score. He had a great game, 34 points. 19 rebounds and I think seven assists. That was his final line. Yeah, he had a great game, but it wasn't efficient. It wasn't enough. And so, yes, Nikola Jokic is a great player. Is he the best player in the league? Maybe he is. Maybe he is. But I think there's a few guys, mainly Luka Doncic, Giannis, SGA is entering that territory. Anthony Edwards is entering that territory. If Jason Tatum has a great Eastern Conference Finals and NBA Finals and finally breaks through and gives the Celtics a championship, I think he's gonna enter that class. And so it's not fair to say that Nikola Jokic is just miles ahead of all of these players because that's not true. And I think that the way that was 
not solidify, but the way that was shown was the discrepancy in the MVP race. Me personally, I would have given MVP to SGA because he averaged 30 points on a team that was the youngest team ever to be in the position that they were in. Game six of the conference semifinals, 30 points a game, number one seed for the Oklahoma City Thunder. Who was, who was expecting OKC to be that good? Literally nobody. So, I mean, I would have given MVP to Shea Gilgis Alexander. And so, yeah, that's just what I think about the MVP race and the best player in the league. The best player in the league, as far as I'm concerned, that throne is vacant right now. Somebody is going to have to either Luka Doncic or Jason Tatum. I think those are the two guys or Anthony Edwards that really have a chance. Not so much Tyrese Halliburton because I don't think he's that... I don't even think he's really a superstar yet. I just think he's in the position he's in because of the injuries that the Pacers were lucky to face in the first two rounds. But I'm not taking anything away from him. I just don't think he's in that class of Jason Tatum, Luka Doncic, or Anthony Edwards. Those three guys are going to duke it out. And then whoever comes out on top, you can call him the best player in the world if you want. But I think even through the offseason, that spot for the number one in the league is going to be vacant because the guy that everybody was saying was miles ahead of everybody else his team wet the bed in a game seven, blew a 20 point lead at home. And I'm not just going to let that slide. So that's what I think about that. Thank you for watching this video. I want a little bit of a rant there at the end. Let me know what you guys think about that. Who is the best player in the league? Is it still Nikola Jokic by a mile? Maybe you disagree with me. Let me know in the comments below. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure to like, comment, share, and find the rest of my content linked in the description.